I think since since the advent of, of COVID-19, some of the challenges uh, that we face as people professionals are unprecedented. And now more than ever, we need a strong foundation giving us the confidence and that capability to guide the decision-making actions and behaviors. And this is how this, this new profession map comes in uh, play, uh, giving us that core understanding of how we make decisions in a sound and uh, mindful uh, way for the benefit of our organizations and the people working in there. So I'm not gonna keep on my eye on the charts all the time. I'm just gonna pick up questions as uh, they come across. I'll do a bit of introduction for myself and then I'll ask you to introduce yourself. So uh, my name is uh, Cipriana Archire, uh, chip like potato chip. It's easy for everybody to remember how to call me. Um, I'm an associate member and I've been working for the CFD for about four years. Yep. With uh, three years before that being part of uh, being a volunteer in, in uh, one of the branches across London. My background before CAPD is a mix of, of business operations and HR management. I've worked for large global organizations as well as uh, small and uh, startups at the beginning of, of their journey. So employing 25 people at the time when, when I joined one of them. Uh, and my background and experience has been a mix of generalist HRM and, and bringing to life some, some of those core processes in organizations. I've looked after talent management for a global organization. I've done um, learning and development and some leadership development programs for a non-for-profit in, um, in my career. And currently in my role, uh, I have a, a dual role where a lead on a portfolio of strategic projects and programs to deal with uh, people, organizational transformation and change. And my second part of the role is overseeing CPD London with all the activities that we deliver for 25,000 members um, within M25, as well as how we consolidate with the seven local branches to create a consistent program of engagement for our members here. Uh, so that's my day job. My gay job is I am the founder and chair of CBD's LGBT uh, network, which has started to, to be an, an internal network looking after the employees at CAPD and has developed some activities externally as well, like Pride and everything else that we've delivered externally. And I also sit on CAPD's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Steering Group, where we look at uh, the DNI strategy and how it impacts different areas. So um, how we align the external advice, research, and policy that, that we offer from CAPD with our internal practice and, and vice versa. So that is me in a nutshell. And what you have on your screen is a QR code as well. So if you have your phone and you want to connect with me over LinkedIn, all you have to do is just open your camera and scan that through. And it's going to take you to my LinkedIn if you want to connect. Now, to get to know you a bit better, we're going to use a mix of the chat functionality because we have almost 140 people in here. Uh, we're going to use a mix of chat and a bit of, of, of pools. So I've prepared two specific questions to ask you um, that you're going to see on your screen now. Uh, one of them is about your membership grade, whether you are currently a member of the CAPD or not. And so I, I can see already 100 votes came in. And if we have non-members, please use the chat box. I will to do a bit of introduction. Perfect, so we have 45% of of attendees um, in student membership, 35% in associate, 12% in chartered membership, 4% 4, 4 in chartered fellowship, 1% in uh, chartered companionship, 2% um, affiliate, and 1% academic member. 
Perfect, that is really good. And I was also interested in sort of the, the field or the area that you're working in, whether it's a generalist or a specialist function. And that gives me a bit of understanding of what sort of examples we will see coming through from the decisions you're making, whether they are generalist part of activity in organizations or they look after organization development. Nice employee relations, early careers. Senior lecturer, oh, that's lovely to meet you, Yvette. Business partnering, so I think that that sort of fits in generalist HR. Consultants, that's really good. So predominantly HR generalists. Um, we have 12% learning and development, 5% OD and change management, 8% talent management, uh, talent and, and recruitment, 4% reward, compensation and benefits, 9% um, people currently just studying. And we've had some other coming in through the chat box as well. Perfect, thank you very much for that. Great to see such, such a diverse mix of, of experiences. So this is the profession map um, that we will basically be, be basing our session around. And this has been launched in November 2018, 6th of November 2018 to be more exact. And because we're working in this complex times of, of being a people professionals, specifically in the past seven weeks, seven weeks of, of lockdown that we've reached in the UK and the world of work has been shifting very fast so many um, certainties that we would have had before have been swept away the future will also rise all new questions all new opportunities that some of them we can't even see at, at this stage and now more than ever we need that strong foundation for effective decision making and the new profession map provides us with that foundation by setting up the knowledge behavior required uh, to make the greatest impact in organizations and thrive in the world of work. And what we are going to cover actually from the profession map is just that three core um, values that you see in there on the screen. So it's principles led, evidence-based and outcomes driven. There is no particular order to them, but we are going to, to um, play with them in, in that specific order that I just mentioned then. So part of the profession map and, and what it is and what it does is it sets the international standard for people prof professionals to make the greatest impact and thrive in a changing world of work. So it looks at what is the DNI of an, an effective people professional and how we can use that to actually enhance the experience of, of individuals and communities alike. So it's an overview, it defines the knowledge, behaviors, values, and purpose underpinning the people profession and everything else, everything that we have in common in that element. As part of the purpose, it aligns the purpose with the purpose of the CAPD, which is that championing better work and working lives for the benefit of organizations, individuals, and societies at large. And then has those three professional values, principles led, evidence-based, and outcomes driven that we're gonna drill down later on today. And underneath those, sort of the, the next level down is everything that we define as being the standard. So the, uh, these are relevant to all people professionals, regardless of, of their role, regardless of their um, sector and specialism, um, whether you're a CAPD member or not, you can still use that to almost like benchmark yourself against um, what it means to be a good professional at that specific level that, that you're operating and you're generating impact on. And it applies equally if you're an employee, consultant or self-employed. So today we're going to cover on this particular area, so that, that our professional values and as part of, of that, we are calling this um, journey or profession for the future. So we're defining the uh, uh, roadmap for better work and working lives and, and how we're taking 
people, professionals, and organizations from where they are today to, to this bright future. So the new profession map won't tell you exactly what to do. Uh, so it's not as, as pres prescriptive as that, but it will show you how being principles-led, evidence-based, and outcomes-driven leads to better decision-making in any situation. And applying these professional values will guide professional teams and organizations to uncertain future as it unfolds. Helping you to ensure the decisions you make are long-term, provide positive impact on yourself, organization, on the uh, professional community, the wider society, and, and everything in there. Yes, you will get the slides. So you will get the slides and you, all, you also get some uh, useful links that uh, I've prepared for you as part of this. And the recording as well. Um, what was I? So you, you may generate that, that impact in there. And to be really a, a truly uh, rounded people professional, you need to work on the benefit of, of all those different stakeholders. So the few, yourself, organization, and professional community and how you build uh, as, as part of that. I've prepared a little video for, for you here that gives you a bit more of understanding of, of that impact that they were trying to generate. You know that when someone's brilliant at their job, it's not just because of what they know, it's because of how they apply it. In the changing world of work, you'll encounter more situations that are completely new or that don't fit your current policies, processes and rules. So how you apply what you know will be increasingly important. The professional values will help you to apply the new knowledge and behaviour standards to all those different situations and to make decisions that benefit people as well as the business. The professional values are principles-led, evidence-based and outcomes-driven. Being principles-led means considering what you stand for as a people professional when you're making tough choices. So even when there's no obvious rule or precedent, you still have a clear purpose to guide you. Not all evidence is equal. That's why when you make decisions, you need to base them on the best evidence available, not a feeling, a fad or selective vision. If you're evidence-based, you always have the data to support and drive your professional judgment. Finally, for work to be better for everyone, you need to balance business outcomes with people ones. That means asking yourself, what is it I want to achieve? And do those outcomes include happier employees and communities, as well as a more profitable business? These professional values will help you to make good decisions in the changing world of work. But it's when you use them together with the new profession map that you will make your biggest impact and achieve something amazing. sums up a lot of what we're going to talk to through tonight and we're going to be exploring uh, those core cool three areas that we've mentioned as, as professional values. So primarily we're going to look at uh, what principles like look like and how we put it in the context of, of organization and we're going to talk through some, some of the examples that will come from the room. Um, so if you're looking at, at principles led, what it's being defined as is how you see beyond the rules and doing what, what is right and what is right for those multiple different stakeholders that you're um, meant to have an impact on. And then evidence-based, which um, colleague Justin, you, know, you've just had mentioned, how to use the best available evidence to inform your judgment to make your case. And then last but not least, that element of outcomes driven. So not necessarily looking at that input and the activities that you're um, working on every day is actually how do I generate outcomes and impact uh, that will maximize the, the value to, to um, the organization. So firstly, on, on principles led, um, our decision actions and behaviors should be laid by clear principles and beliefs, uh, particularly at times of, of significant change that we're experiencing at the moment. Rules and uh, laws provide boundaries that um, are never sufficient themselves for, for us to be able to make um, decisions with unintended outcomes. 
outcomes. That's why we define three key principles as a pathway for good decisions, regardless of the context in which those decisions are being made. So something that I normally relate with, with this principle, with this value, the principles led is this element that um, just because it's legal, uh, it's not necessarily right. And uh, we keep looking back in, in history to this, uh, say stuff like a um, few uh, decades ago, it was illegal for women to vote. That doesn't necessarily mean it was right. Slavery and segregation were both legal. That doesn't mean they were right. So how do we put in place some principles that will allow us to make sound decisions regardless of the circumstances we're in? So the first one that, that we'll, ex we'll explore. So while we're going through these, what I want you to picture in your head, uh, a recent situation that you've had to make a quick decision that impacted either organization or uh, some, some people in, in the work that you're doing. And I want you to keep that in your mind while we're going through, through these three principles so you can understand exactly if it has been applied or, or if you could have applied it differently. So as the world of work, uh, of, of work keeps evolving, we'll encounter more and more situations that are completely new, that are completely novel to, to what we're uh, used to, with no process or precedent to follow. So we've had new words come up from, from the dictionary. We've had a, a furlough that just got ingrained in our heads in the past few, few weeks. We've had uh, social distancing as an organizational measure um, with social distancing experts that came out, out at that time uh, quite quickly to, to support uh, societies at large. So unprecedented um circumstances that we're dealing with at the moment actually require us to, to make some of those decisions and in such situations the, these three key principles are the path to good decisions the first one that you already see on your on your screen is that work matters and that should be part of how we balance our decision making so work should and can be a force for good for organizations workers and the communities, societies, and economies that take part of. Good work is purposeful, is designed to help everyone use their skills and talents effectively and find personal meaning in the work they do. Good work is safe and inclusive. It recognizes contribution in a fair manner and values human connection. Good work exists for the long-term benefits of individuals, or organizations and society, balancing economic sustainability and social accountability. Just read Marcus comment. So next one is people matter. To balance that um, element, we're gonna cover a bit of, of people matter where people are fundamental to businesses and organizations alike. They are unique and worthy of care, understanding, and investment. So I think we've all might have seen on social media that picture where the CFO asks the CEO what happens if we invest in these people and they leave. And the CEO answers what happens if we don't invest in them and they stay. Uh, I think that's part of how we understand valuing people in a very simplistic way. Now, People should have access to the opportunity to access an opportunity to work and be provided with the support development resources to be effective. In turn, individuals have that personal responsibility for their work, development, and behavior. People deserve to be treated fairly and have a meaningful voice on matters that affect them, in addition to their rights and protected under the law. So we're looking at employee voice and how that is being reflected into organizations. And last but not least, the third principles as part of this trio is professionalism matters. 
So for the people profession, this means we are all ambassadors for the people profession, acting with integrity and championing better work and working lives in everything that we do. We are committed to continual development and to making value-based decisions. We are experts on people, work and change and use our understanding of how business creates value to balance the risks and opportunities inherent in many organizations. We understand the implications of our decisions beyond the interest of our organizations for the goods of the wider society. So that is basically how we define that element of, of professionalism matters. But what we must do is almost balance all of those three elements. And the way we, we, we balance that is, if you're thinking now about those three principles under the principles led that I've just mentioned, so work matter, people matter, professionalism matters. Um, and I've asked you to think about the recent decision that you've had to make, um, whether you've balanced all of those three elements or, or not. Um, it's up to how we take learning environments from that and we continue to, to build uh, positive behaviors in the future. So what I wanted to do now is split you up in a few uh, working groups, almost like they will look almost like table discussions. So when you go in a, in a breakout room, you're, you can unmute yourself and you can turn on your camera so you can contribute with everybody else. We will do that for about, let me say, 55. We will do that for 10 minutes, Is 10 minutes enough for quickly introducing yourself and make sure everybody in the room has an opportunity to quickly introduce who they are. Um, explore together how the three principles that you've just heard affect your day-to-day -day decision making, whether you're working in HR, L&D, OD, in-house or consultant or independent. And then explore ways you can turn these into de facto operating models for um, all your decisions from now on in organizations. So I'll give you 10 minutes. I'm gonna split you into rooms of, let's say, eight, eight people. So we're gonna have 15 rooms and I will see you back here in, about 12 minutes. So what you're gonna see now on the screen is a pop-up asking you to go into a breakout room and in there you'll be able to unmute yourself and have conversations with everybody else. Yes, yes, Francesca, I agree with you. So looking at the principles and actually the all three professional values is quite critical at, at the time and how we're making decisions because we literally have to make hundreds of decisions every day that impact the business in ways that we haven't anticipated before. And we don't have the same time to actually analyze how all of those decisions will have either mid or long-term impact. Perfect, so now that we've looked through principles led and, and what that looks like, if we're looking into the next element, which is that element of evidence-based, we need to understand that the new profession map and, and this framework doesn't actually tell us what to do, but among other things, it will show us how being evidence-based contributes to, being, uh, to making better decisions in any situation. So after all, your professional opinion carries more weight when it's supported by strong evidence from diverse sources. That's why the new profession map places such emphasis on evidence-based decision-making with evidential understanding of impact and outcomes. And what we normally say that the evidence is, is beyond just the numbers alone. And what I normally use to refer to this situation is we need to understand what works best for the situation um, that we're dealing with in the context uh, we're in 
for the type of organization that we are uh, at the level of readiness that we're experiencing with the uh, level of knowledge and capability of the people we're working with. So multiple different uh, elements that uh, we're exploring while we're making decisions and that element of evidence base needs to steer us away from that uh, element of best practice, which is mostly defined of what worked really well for one organization at one time to what good practice looks like, sort of what are the underpinning principles that we can apply that will allow us to make some decisions in the future as well. So if we're looking at the type of, of evidence, um, there's all of these different uh, sources of, of evidence, um, if we should call them that, or uh, sources of data that we can pull into making our, our decisions um, neat. And what we've put into this it has been inspired by the Center for Evidence-Based Management, and we worked with them on adopting their uh, framework to what it means to the HR. And we've come up with four different um, sources of evidence that will allow us to make sound decisions. The first one is this element of behavior science and uh, academic research. And by paying close attention to the theory underpinning our profession, we can make some sound decisions no matter what the future may hold. Um, an understanding of the psychology of human behavior provides us with the science behind how people behave and make decisions. Independent surveys, reviews, and benchmark can also help us to better understand our own organization. And that is almost at the first layer of, of this data gathering exercise. Second one as a source of evidence, we're looking at organizational data. And probably this is the one that you're most familiar with. And organizational data means people analytics that can help us uh, get to know our workforce better, how people contribute to business performance, what our skills gaps are, um, where do we have areas of unique expertise, um, the level of employee well-being and engagement. Ultimately, what it means is that employers can invest more strategically in their people. Investors can recognize human capital as a fundamental uh, element of business strategy, and workers can benefit from better opportunities and greater fulfillment because we're looking at that level of organizational data. Third one on is stakeholder concerns or stakeholder uh, sources of, of evidence. And there is nothing more important or more human than gathering information from your own experiences and conversations. As professionals, we need to observe our cultures to understand the organization's capabilities, engaging with business leaders and asking questions to understand their world with its risks, challenges and potential. And we're talking about all sorts of stakeholders you would be dealing with. And I'm not gonna mention um, all of them because some of the roles like mine are almost between the organization and the external environment. So for example, for me, some of the stakeholders would be HR leaders and how uh, CBD London engages with HR leaders to, to provide them with support. And they are an external stakeholder. And internal stakeholders would be the HR director that I will have to work on cascading some of the information that we're working with. And then last but not least, as part of that um, element is that practitioner expertise. Um, as practitioner expertise and professional judgments are important in applying evidence to practice, forming the basis of the skills needed and draw effective solutions from different insights. And the way all of these four areas come together, they look like this. And this is um, one of the scenarios that we've designed with the um, Center of Evidence-Based Management. So it looks at the four level of evidence, sort of scientific literature, which we've mentioned earlier, um, looking at empirical studies, organization, that internal data, stakeholders, what they value and what, they concern, what their concerns are, and then practitioners that professional expertise 
at the end. So before I take you to the next level in showing you how we actually, uh, what we actually do with, with this um, information and with this evidence that we've just gathered, I want to understand from the sources that you have access to, which ones you normally use for decision-making for your role. And this is um, multiple choice questions, so you can pick as many as possible. Now, so it's currently looking as a battle between organizational data and stakeholder concerns <clears throat> with 80 votes that came in already. Perfect. So, as expected, the most accessible data and source of evidence that we can get is that organizational data. Um, and I want you to start thinking about what type of organizational data you would be able to pull in, in, in the decision that you will have to make. And then we have stakeholder concerns, which are basically either data driven or anecdotal driven. So you might have a conversation in understanding the needs and concerns of different stakeholders. We have 65% uh, of people practitioner expertise. And then last but not least, that behavior science and academic research with 29%. and others, we have some others as well. So use research such as the expert HR surveys in the past to support people proposals. The focus would be stats law, case law, any relevant code of practice, internal law, policy. Yep. I agree they're all sources of data and sources of, of evidence that you can gather and normally if you've encountered the situation before you would probably have some policy around it if it's a new and unknown situation um, then you're likely to find the evidence external to, to your organization so now there are six steps that you need to take into um, how your analyzing and, and using all of this evidence-based data that you've gathered and sources to make sound decisions. And I'm just going to take you through this. I've put it in the slide so you can also access it afterwards. Um, you could print it and put it on, on your wall if, if uh, you want to and, and keep it at your hand. So evidence-based practice is about making decisions through unknown circumstances with unknown uh, variables that we need to, to use at those four different sources to take them through six different steps. So the first one is asking, so looks at translating a practical issue or problem into an answerable question. And what we normally get as this is the organization might come with a very vague problem that they're trying to uh, deal with. So it might be something comes over to say that they think people are disengaged or um, a rate of engagement is not as should be expected. And what we need to do in the first point is we need to ask questions to turn that into an answerable solution. And it might be of, what is our expected engagement scores and how do we measure engagement in our specific organization and what is different from our organization to others that will allow us to define engagement differently than others or similar to others. 
So those are some of the practical questions you need to turn from almost that problem solving uh, that you would have just thrown at you. The next one is acquiring. So you will systematically do a search for and retrieve evidence out of those four areas or more if you have more different areas that, that you can look into. And you'll basically be compiling mountains of, of data, some with uh, different reliability, some with internal or external use, some with already ingrained positivity bias in there towards specific um, frameworks. And then you'll have to be appraising. So you'll critically judge the trustworthiness and relevance of the evidence. So you might find that some research reports uh, or some um, evidence or case study that comes from a supplier might be might have some positivity bias towards that technology or that supplier specifically. Um, and what you need to do is appraise sort of the suitability of, of that to be uh, put into um, your data gathering. And as part of that, you'll also be aggregating. So you'll be waiting and pulling together the evidence and you'll basically be scoring on the reliability of the data and the reliability of the source, whether that has a stronger weight or a less, um, a weaker weight on your decision making. And after you've done all of those for the different uh, data sources you've gathered and the different models you've, you've looked into, you'll be applying that. So you'll be incorporating the evidence into the decision-making process. You might come up with different solutions, uh, more than one with um, different frameworks with different impacts on different stakeholders. Um, and before you close this, you'll be assessing. So you'll be evaluating the outcome of that decision with those potential scenarios. And basically you're doing all of these to increase the likelihood of a fa favorable outcome for your decision making. So now we said our preferred or, or our most upheld source of evidence would be organizational data. I want you to use the chat box to give me examples of what sort of organizational evidence you would be able to use in decision making. Some of them that I normally find are payroll data, performance, employee engagement. You have some diversity and inclusion data, recruitment, exit interviews. You might have a skills or a skills gap analysis or a learning needs analysis in your organization. Nice, so a lot of Great comments coming through from retention, salary benchmarking, performance. Nice scientific journals. Engagement surveys, open text box, give further insight. 360 degree survey. Absence records, of course. Pulse survey, if the organization is doing any of those. Employee relations data and cases of reporting, if you're doing any of that. Any feedback that you have on the learning proposition. Business performance, it's good. Benchmarking, yep. If you're doing any sort of benchmarking to compare yourself with the organizations in the same sector outside. Perfect. So now, what are your main challenges in being evidence-based? So now you know the four areas of evidence you need to gather, 
you've mentioned that the organizational one is most up to hand. We've listed probably 60 or 70 different data sources. What are your main challenges? And you can also raise your hand if you want to, if you want me to unmute you and you can, you can contribute by voice. So there's one on reliability of data that came over. Time. Yeah, I think there's a bit of organizational buying in there, using the data to bring senior management or beneficiaries on board with decisions. Time pressure, bandwidth. See a lot of senior managers <laughs> agreeing with the decisions or agreeing with the data or anything else. It's a bit of managing upwards as well. Stakeholders, strong organizational collaborative work, HI and finance. And ethical decision biases. I think sometimes you can see them on a chart a mile away. Relativity of data, cost to access. That may cost financially or cost of time. Internal politics, yes. I like that. People want to ignore evidence if it doesn't suit their agenda. I think no one can, can beat some solid evidence. But that's just my opinion. Struggle to get 100% of company, to complete staff survey. And that might just be a data point. The question would be, why don't they feel 100%? Do we even want 100%? How would that be helpful? So you always have the disengaged or the less engaged. And I think that's a healthy thing as well. So looking at that data point from different angles, I would be scared if someone would 100% fill in engagement surveys. I would be suspicious of, of the data. Perception can often trump facts, which is true which what basically what we're trying to do is move away from, from that level of, of perception or um, that element of, of gut feeling that can beat data. What is good enough evidence? I think it depends on the decision you're trying to make as well. So if you're looking at, we are an organization of 150,000 employees trying to remove performance management altogether because it's trendy. Um, a good amount of, of evidence would be understanding how people would feel about that, how they view performance, how managers would be able to still be supportive across the organization, what type of different roles you have in there. So you'll be able to gather a lot of data just just on, on that element. Yeah, 
So, sorry, I agree with you. If and different stakeholders in that team might be different, might respond to different data. So some of them might be resisting change, and some of them might not feel comfortable comfortable that the change will actually be favorable. Perfect. So lots of challenges. So keep the comments coming. What I will also be doing is I'll download the chat and then I'll pick up some, some of the key points and, and make some lists and send them back to you with the slides and um, with the presentation um, and the recording. I'll make sure I remove the names associated to people and just make some, some list of some of the challenges and some of the uh, organizational data that we've mentioned in there. Perfect. So now we got to the third element out of these professional values. So if we've done uh, that principles led and we looked at work matters, uh, professionalism matters, and people matter and we sort of try to balance those to what they mean for our decision making and and how we can make decisions by having all of them three uh, balance and, and not just looking at work without looking at people or people without work uh, to make sound decisions for the future of our organizations. Then we've looked a bit through evidence-based practice. So we looked at those four um, evidence sources that we've, we've mentioned, um, and we've quickly gone through those six steps that I'm hoping that based on the notes that um, I'm gonna send out, you're gonna just trial a decision that you've made recently, go back on it and say, what data have I gathered? Where did it came from? Have I taken these six steps? Do they even make sense to me? And if you can reduce it to five steps or four steps, then that's even greater, um, as long as you can understand how that framework can actually improve your decision making, and if you're missing any specific gaps in the data that you're gathering. Now, on outcomes driven, the work that we all have to do as people professionals might be must be driven by understanding the context and the outcomes, including both value and risk. Context of the organization, strategic imperatives and um, operational delivery, as well as the challenging context of work, workforce, and the workplace. All of these play different um, weights in how we make decisions looking at outcomes. And all of the outcomes that we have need to be aligned with that wider purpose that I mentioned at the beginning of better work and working lives. How do we make sure we provide that for the people in the organization, for the organization we're working for, for, as well as for societies and communities outside of that? So championing better work and working lives means making a positive difference at every level, personal, professional, and social. The people profession is here to create more sustainable and productive businesses, inspire, a more skilled, motivated workforce, make people happier and more fulfilled at work and outside, and help communities flourish. To do all of that together as the people profession. Now, as outcomes driven, we've separated these four different levels of impact that you can look into the decision you're making, or they have an impact in those areas. And the first one, as you probably would expect, is that work. So we improve the collective well-being, success, and productivity of organization, the people within them, and the society in which we all belong. People should be expected based on the three principles. 
So our impact on people is that we build inclusive organizations that treat people fairly, respond to diverse voices, and develop people for improved personal employability and organizational sustainability. We improve skills in the wider workforce and society. Third one is that impact on the profession and that element of professionalism. We build the strengths, credibility and integrity of the people profession, leading to better decision makings on matters that affect people, work and change. Mentioned earlier that the way we define people professionals is that expert on people, work and change. And the last one is the impact on individuals. So the degree of impact you make will vary depending on your career stage, or what you're working on and where you work. The one thing that we can all do is strive towards positive outcomes for people as well as for business or organization if you work in an organization that doesn't like to be called a business. That's not always an easy balance to strike, but the future of the profession is one where we can all hold both business outcomes and people outcomes in equal balance. So what do we mean by impact? And, and this is what I pulled from the professional standards is that value that your work, our work as people professional creates for those multiple stakeholders we will be working with. And we're not talking about outputs. So I'm not talking about, I've just created the most amazing learning program that should be an output. We're actually talking about the impact. So how that work met the needs of different stakeholders in different ways. So what is the value that me providing that output created in the organization and for the different stakeholders? So we're not talking about the what, but we're talking about so what? So, so what if you've delivered that project? What is the value that it, it generated to measure the impact? So the output is that new approach to performance management in place, as an example. The value that has created for the organization is that managers are having a focused development discussions, employees feel that the culture is more positive. And then you can have specific data and metrics that measures that impact. So you can have um, the measurable value. So productivity measures, engagement survey results, absence data. And this can also be input data and input uh, evidence sources for other decisions you're going to make. Or this is basically how you would do benchmarking and comparison with a different organization. You would look at some of these stats in the relative context of the similarity between the organizations, um, some of the different uh, contexts that the organizations are, are in, because we would never try to compare like a large organization with a small one. I think one of the um, things that jumps to mind is how the market used to measure the impact of diversity and inclusion in organizations. And you would have seen all of these research reports that says that um, having a diverse workforce improves your bottom line by um, 1.5 million pounds, um, something like that. And for some organizations where that is not even close to, to their bottom line, um, that has nothing to do with, with the finances. So you would have small organizations where that is not the value that they, they would um, bring in by having a diverse workforce. And then you have other evidence uh, forms demonstrating that change has been taken, um, which we were talking earlier about could be conversations with people, interviews, feedback forms, um, if you have any anecdotal of, of how a project has been received and what is the impact that it generated or how it made people feel afterwards. Perfect. So we still have about 
17 minutes left. Um, I wanted us to go back into the group conversations that we've had earlier, or maybe new groups, so we can get to know each other a bit better. And in there, I want you to look at all three elements. So I want you to look at principles-led, evidence-based, and outcomes-driven. And through conversation, I want you to explore how these three professional values will change the way you make decisions from now onwards. Whether it's you've just decided that you need to look into different sources of evidence when you're making decisions, or you've decided that the way you're looking at outcomes needs to change as an organization or as an HR department, um, or whether you've decided that maybe you need to work on convincing those senior stakeholders more that the second principles of people matter needs to be activated as part of your organization to deliver value. So I'm just going to put this here for you. I'm just going to recreate the breakout rooms. I'm going to recreate them from scratch. And um, should I say 10 minutes? So if you spend 10 minutes in the breakout rooms, and I'm just going to move between them to make sure that the conversation is, is flowing. Um, and then if we come back, we will be looking in how we turn these into habits. So the part of your conversation would be the feedback to me, different ideas of how we can turn some of these into habits for people professionals. So if you want to share verbally, you can also unmute yourself and do that and introduce yourself to the wider group. I like that. So everyone agreed that leading by principles is the easiest part of the role. We to chat about having scenarios and outcomes. Yeah, so I agree with you, June. So you would have different emphasis on a different value depending on the decision you have to make, but also how these values align or not with the wider organization. And we've seen senior stakeholders brought in the conversation a lot. Yeah, I agree with you, Veronica. So I think we all need to remember that we're acting on behalf of the entire profession. And it's almost like, what would you want to be remembered for in that specific decision? Nice, possibly sharing the values with stakeholders, which I agree. The use of that, that, that needs to be more friendly and more people are familiar and confident with it. I think we've seen um, a lot of intake into the people profession on um, people with the background of analytics. So we'll be able to see more of that. And as that happens, we'll get to the point where people analytics and almost like data visualiz visualization becomes uh, a bit easier for everybody. So tools that will allow us to pick up trends from, from that a bit easier. Principles need to be embedded into the roles and responsibilities that understood through the organization. Senior managers overseeing. Yeah. When it comes to evidence base, sometimes have to scramble around for the evidence to support a pre-agreed decisions that we're not party to. Um, 
sometimes happens, hopefully not, not too often. Good to see the statement on the side that people working on individual people, not just business. Yep. So there's that balance between the needs of the individuals and the needs of the organization. Perfect. So I typed in some, some of them. Um, so normally when you're making decisions, you might not be able to go through some of those. And I think time was one of the main challenges that was um, identified by uh, the people in the room as well. So take your time to make decisions, whether that is not having to make a decision at 5 p.m. on a Friday, but trying to understand if you can postpone making the decision until Monday 9 a.m. so you can have that time to reflect and think about the implications, um, if you're applying the principles correctly, if you've had enough evidence gathered, um, and if the outcomes that the decision will make are positive outcomes for uh, all stakeholders involved or the main stakeholders involved. Um, step back and reflect challenges and circumstances. So you might be picking up learning points from different situations you have dealt with in the past. Um, just use that as a reflective space. And I know that we're all cramped these days. Some of us working overtime and, and trying to pull through and keeping our organizations together. Just make sure you're looking after yourself as well at this time. Set clear guiding rules yourself so if printing it and having on the wall that evidence-based practice um, poster works for you then do that just think of what works best for you in being able to apply some some of these some of them will be how do i become more strategic and ma manage upwards to support my senior uh, managers to understand where i'm coming from and this is what comes here so be a strategic provide, uh, advisor and deploy prescriptive strategies. So how do you advise that those will be implemented and, and what is the expected outcome from them? Leverage the CPD cycle in your learning. So remember that reflection, implement, share, going back and analyzing, um, deciding, implementing and sharing. And I've seen a lot of exchange of contacts in the chat functionality as well. Um, which is great because you're creating a community of practitioners that have similar interests and might be able to um, share different practices. Stay connected to the roadmap. So look ahead, where, where, where are we going and how are these decisions actually supporting the long-term vision of the organization? So we're all in this together. So we're not in the same boat, but we're in the same storm and different organizations will react differently what is happening currently in the market and, and how that affects us. And remember to celebrate success. I think once, once we've gone through this, it's important that we celebrate all of this. Um, even if it's little, just celebrate it. If you've received some positive feedback from employees on a great initiative that you've implemented or you've responded to some of their needs, just remember to celebrate that. And that just builds that behavior that you're looking into. So before I go into questions, I want to share this with you. So we will all be okay at the end of this. We'll go through this. We will, as the queen said, we will meet again and we'll be together again. Uh, remember to look after yourself. And if you have any questions, so if you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, you can just scan with your phone the code. That is my email address. If you want to drop me an email, if you have more questions that you don't want to ask online. And for more resources about the profession map and about the three professional values, you can go to peopleprofession.capd.org.